Welcome to this video on the linear momentum equation for non-inertial frames of reference or accelerating coordinate systems. We've talked before about linear momentum uh, using uh, a non-accelerating coordinate system or an inertial frame of reference. And now we're going to talk about what happens if you use a coordinate system that's accelerating. Now why would we want to do that? Well it turns out working some problems is a lot easier if you're in a frame of reference that's moving and if it's moving it may be accelerating. So uh, the example I have for that is actually on your screen here. If you look at this picture, this is a, a recent SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launch. This is the one with the Crew Dragon and uh, it's, it's a, an important one because this is the, the first time the US has launched from its own soil to put people back into space since the end of the space shuttle program. And in analyzing that, that rocket it's often easier to put a, a, an, a, a coordinate system that's actually fixed to the rocket. So here's the rocket, you know, if I do a control volume around it, if I put a coordinate system that's fixed to the rocket, so this is actually, a lot of times when we say it's fixed to the surface, they'll put a little person standing there. So you know it's actually moving with the control volume there. Since the rocket is accelerating, the coordinate system is accelerating. So it'd be helpful if we could analyze linear momentum using that kind of accelerating coordinate system. So we're going to talk about that today. I also have a personal reason to show this picture, and the reason for that is one of those astronauts, um, Robert Bankin, Bob Bankin, was actually a graduate student buddy of mine back when I was at Caltech in the, uh, the 1990s. Um, Bob was just a couple offices down, we hung out a lot, we camped together, we went on vacations together, so uh, this was a very special launch for me to see my buddy Bob up into space. All right, so let's go ahead and um, get right into the material. Oh, before I do that, I wanted to show you another kind of rocket related uh, video. This one's just sort of for fun, and again, it's kind of personal to me. So here on the screen, you have the SpaceX, you know, very high tech kind of launch. The one I'm going to show you is going to be a lot less high tech. I mean, let me see if I can pull this up and play the audio. So this was, let me just set this up for you on the screen. This was a video uh, a long time ago when my kids were little, I had made a water rocket. So now what a water rocket is, it's basically a, a long PVC pipe and you connect in a, um, a tire valve, like a bicycle tire valve, and then you pump up uh, air into the, into the PVC pipe. And at the top of the PVC, PVC pipe, you have a two liter bottle that's filled partially with water. So what ends up happening is you pump air into the PVC pipe, like with a bicycle pump, it pressurizes the air in the water bottle or in the two liter bottle it has some water so it gets all pressurized and you have a little uh, device that holds the bottle in place while you pump it up so it gets pressurized and then uh, you'll see in the video I pull a string and it'll release the water bottle and then the water bottle goes up like a rocket right so it's just that pressurized air pushes the water out creates some momentum flux and that gives the thrust for the rocket so you'll see the video here I've turned up the volume I'm not sure if you're gonna pick that up very well but I like it because it's a bunch of the neighborhood kids, including my kids, here having a good time. So let's see if we can get this to work. So they're, they're talking to the neighbor here, saying, watch this, that's my wife holding the camera. I'm in the middle there trying to pump up the, uh, pump the air into the, the bottle. You can see that the PVC pipe's a little bit flexible, so it's kind of vibrating a bit there. The neighborhood dog's in on the action, running around. It's chaos. And here I'm having a little trouble trying to get it to release, but it'll happen soon enough here. No, it's not going! And there you go. Thing goes up pretty far, you know, a good 100 feet in the air. And you can see it's a lot of fun. So, you know, fun with science and engineering. Get the neighborhood kids involved uh, safely. Um, it can be a, a really good time. So good memories there. All right, so let's talk a bit about the linear momentum equation using a non-inertial frame of reference. There's a lot of math if you do the derivation for this. There's a lot of kinematics. We're not going to go through any of that. Um, I'm just going to give you the final result, but I want to sort of describe how it's set up. So on the, on the screen here, you'll see a inertial coordinate system or non-accelerating coordinate system. That one's in capital letters here. So this one is inertial. 
we're non-accelerating. And then over here we have the little x, y, z one. This one is accelerating. And that one is non-inertial. So that's the little x, y, z. And it could be accelerating in translation. So you know, going in a, you know, faster or slower, moving in a curved path. And it can also be accelerating in rotation. So it could be rotating around at the same time. So we have these different ways to make it non-inertial. And what we're saying here is we have some system or some, some control volume. Let me just draw it as a blob here, where we have some fluid particle in there. And the fluid particle is right there. The R, X, Y, Z is the position from our non-inertial frame of reference out to the fluid particle. And that fluid particle may have some velocity with respect to the little x, y, z coordinate, excuse me, coordinate system. Little x, y, z is just measured with respect to that coordinate system. So we're measuring our velocities using our non-inertial coordinate system, not our capital x, y, z, which is inertial one. And what we want to do is write out the linear momentum equation for that. So a lot of math involved. If you're curious about it, you can take a look at my book style notes. I go through all the little steps there. Um, there's a lot to it. Let's just focus on the final result. So the final result is given right here. This is the linear momentum equation now using a non-inertial frame of reference. It's a lot more complicated looking than the linear momentum equation for an inertial frame of reference. And it all comes in because of these uh, acceleration type terms. Okay, they, they produce these what are called fictitious forces. They're forces that, that aren't really real. They, they look like forces because of our coordinate system being non-inertial. Um, but if you used a, a, a non-accelerating coordinate system, like an inertial frame of reference, you wouldn't have those kinds of forces. They're, they're not real forces. So let's talk about the equation. Um, on, let me start with the right-hand side. So here we have the time rate of change of linear momentum in the control volume, where the velocity is measured using our little x, y, z coordinate system. So you've seen that term before. And then here we have our flux of linear momentum out of the control volume through the control surface with a velocity here, again, is measured using our little XYZ coordinate system. The relative velocity, it doesn't matter what coordinate system you use because it's a relative velocity. It's the velocity of the fluid minus the velocity of the control surface. And it doesn't matter whether it's uh, inertial or fixed or any coordinate system. As long as those two velocities are measured using the same coordinate system, you'll, you'll always get the same difference. Right? So the relative velocity is independent of coordinate system. It's this velocity that depends on the coordinate system. So these two terms are the same as what you've seen before. It's just here the velocity is measured using a different coordinate system. And then we have the body forces and the surface forces. Same as before, no, no differences there. <clears throat> What's different is this middle, this term in the middle. This is where these fictitious forces come from. So let me start at the right-hand side. We have a rho dv. This is our little bit of mass integrated over the whole control volume. So it's all the little bits of mass, like this little particle, inside our control volume. So it's all those little bits of mass multiplied by all of these accelerations. So let me describe what each of them is. This first one is the rectilinear acceleration. This is the one we'll actually spend all of our time dealing with. So this is acceleration of, and when I've written this down, first of all, you'll see a little x, y, z with respect to capital X, y, z. It's just how this coordinate system is accelerating with respect to the big lettered uh, coordinate system in rectilinear acceleration. So it's just how the velocity is changing with time, okay, just in translation. Now the next one is the rotational acceleration. So this has to do with this coordinate system spinning. So it's spinning with rotational velocity, little x, y, z, with respect to our inertial coordinate system. So it's spinning around at some rotational velocity. So this takes into account how that coordinate, how that coordinate system may be accelerating in rotation. Okay, maybe starting to spin up faster and faster or slowing down. Right. So it's the acceleration and rotation cross product with the position out to the fluid particle, and you'd have to integrate this over the whole control volume. The next one is a Coriolis acceleration. 
That one you've seen before, probably from the kinematics course, and it has to do with uh, measuring the velocity using a rotating coordinate system. So that's, that's the Coriolis acceleration. Here you see the velocity of the coordinate system as it's rotating, and then this is the velocity of this little fluid particle using our rotating coordinate system. And then you'd have to integrate that up again over the whole control volume for every little fluid particle. And then the last one is the centripetal acceleration. Uh, let's see if I can write the words acceleration here. So that has to do with the fluid particle accelerating towards the center of curvature. Um, so these kinds of accelerations you've seen before probably from a kinematics course. Um, you probably talked about Coriolis accelerations, centripetal accelerations. Um, so they show up here as well when you're dealing with um, rotating coordinate systems. Now, it's complicated looking, and it can get complicated when you're dealing with arbitrary um, accelerating coordinate systems. Fortunately for all of us, uh, we're only going to deal in this course with acceleration, accelerating coordinate systems uh, that ac accelerate in rectilinear movement. So what I'm saying here is that we're, we're going to deal with <clears throat> coordinate systems that don't rotate. If they don't rotate, then what that means is if x omega xyz with respect to capital XYZ is zero, so it means it's the uh, frame of reference isn't rotating. So if that's the case, then you'll see that all these highlighted terms, the omega dot, this omega, these omegas, they all are zero and they go away. So most of that equation gets very simple. I mean, most of those terms disappear, so it makes the equation more simple. And then what we're left with then is, let me rewrite the equation. We have the time rate of change of linear momentum within the control volume, just using our little XYZ coordinate system. Then we have the flux of linear momentum out of the control volume through the control surface where the velocity is measured with respect to our, rotate, our, our accelerating coordinate system. Then we have our body forces and our surface forces, same as before. And then we have this final term, which is the acceleration, our rectilinear acceleration of our coordinate system times the mass in the uh, control volume. So this term here is kind of like a, it's sort of like a, a mass of the control volume times the acceleration. Because rho dv is a little bit of mass, you integrate it over the control volume, gives you the total mass. Okay, so that's the, that's what that term looks like. So we'll solve some problems in separate videos where we use this non-inertial frame of reference just for rectilinear acceleration. If you want to see some problems solved where you have rotation involved, then you can look in my book style notes where I have uh, an example or two like that. I'm not going to make videos of those since we're not going to use them for this course. But, um, but you can see you know, how it's used in those particular cases if you like. All right, I think that's all I need to say about this topic. So take a look at the examples, and if you have any questions, just let me know.